Hi everyone, welcome to this History of Infection. This time I'm talking about death. Death isn't really, obviously, an infection. It can be the cause of a lot of infections, but it's a topic I find quite interesting. We're going to be looking at why death occurs, not so much how death happens. And in this, we're going to try and unwrap the more complicated ideas about death. And by doing this, possibly talk a bit about what life actually is as well. Can you really define death without life? Death has a certain inert nature to it. Things that are dead tend to decay and fade from this world. The elements in your body have been through unfathomable amounts of time and all sorts of different life to end up in you. And you yourself aren't the final resting place for these elements. You're not the end of history. Let's pause here for a second just to think about this as well. I find it fascinating that the atoms inside your head that you're so cleverly using to understand what I'm saying and things I'm using to speak to you could once have been the pancreas of a T-Rex or the kneecaps of Tiktaalik. And that's just wonderful. Through the entire lifespan of this universe, those elements and atoms have been coming together to make all sorts of wonderful things. And now they're inside you. The topic of death brings us to a question I've probably been asked most in the comments section, and that is, what do I consider life to be? We don't really have a fixed and hard definition of what life is, and you could ask any 20 biologists and you'll get 20 different answers of what life actually is. The definition I tend to give, the one I'm most comfortable giving, is life is anything that reproduces after itself and attempts to maintain an environment. This is in some way tailored to exclude viruses because a lot of people don't consider them to be alive just because they're viruses. However, viruses certainly aren't inert and they do tend to act like life and they use the same general chemicals and they live by the same rules of natural selection as life, but for some reason they, they just fall short of that imaginary line where you've drawn under life and said no, they are not in life. Reproduction might give us an idea of what death actually is. An organism only truly dies if it fails to pass on its genetic information to offspring. This definition however, does have a flaw. It does mean any of my viewers who are infertile or just don't want to have children are in some way partially dead, which may or may not shock you. Why then don't we think of people who are infertile as being at least partially dead? I think this is a problem with our perception and not so much with our definition. When someone we know dies, we lose them. We lose the personality. The genetic information might have been passed on, but the children and ancestors are just shadows and flickers of that former person. We lose the personality of that person. We lose them. We don't lose their genetic information. That's what death means to us. But to evolution, death is the failure to pass on your genetic information. So to try and answer what death is spiritually, let's say, or personally, we can't necessarily use a scientific approach because a scientific approach tells us biology the main rule of biology is evolution. If we try and approach things with this evolutionary mindset, they won't give us explanations. They'll give us answers, but they won't give a satisfying response, something that answers why things have to die, or better yet, why do I have to die? So how do we go about explaining death evolutionary using a biological perspective? Well, typically in biology, what we do is we look for examples where the normal rules don't apply. We look for something that's broken, or we break it. For example, we might break a gene and see actually what did that gene do? Now we've broken it, we can see what, what stopped working in this organism. So are there any cases where death is broken? In the very first episode of the series, I talked about the strange and fantastic life history of mitochondria. Mitochondria were once free-floating bacteria. Any biologist stumbling upon them in these ancient days worth his salt, his or her salt I should say, would classify them as free-living, breathing bacteria. Yet, what are them now? They're all dead. Every single one of them, dead. But that hasn't stopped them from being incredibly successful. In every single, almost every single, eukaryotic cell, there will be a mitochondria powering away, respirating for us, producing the energy from the oxygen and sugars we eat. Death hasn't stopped them from being incredibly successful. When I first began to grasp this idea of mitochondria actually evolved to die, it gave me insight just how powerful natural selection and evolution can be. It doesn't mean survival of the fittest, doesn't mean the best and 
able to live and survive, it means the best able to reproduce. And if you can do that without being alive, all the more power to you. So where mitochondria have evolved to die, can we look at examples where animals or organisms evolved to be immortal? Well, let me introduce you to this little jellyfish, whose name, as per usual, I probably am going to screw up. I believe it's Teratopsis nutricula, but I could be just speaking completely wrong there. Name, as always, down below. This little fella is capable of a really remarkable trick. Once it's reproduced, it will revert to its juvenile state. And we're not too sure how many times this jellyfish can do this. Could it just keep doing it constantly and effectively be immortal? There's also an interesting link here between reproduction and death again. So this brings us to our first theory of death. As I stated, the most important act for any organism is to reproduce itself. It doesn't take any great thinking to see if you don't reproduce yourself, you die out. So this means there's probably a very strong pressure to reproduce and reproduce well. However, once you've reproduced, what is there to stop you from just dying? Evolution's done with you, it doesn't care anymore, unless you're going to continue reproducing. What is there left for evolution to act on? There's an argument to be made in species like owls that have these complex social structures that actually the longer lifespan of parents and grandparents is quite useful evolutionary because they can help look after the young. But as I'll mention later on, there's a counter to this argument in the fact that they will start competing with their own offspring, which is bad news for those genes. There's quite a lot of evidence for this idea. For example, in fruit flies, when they were, I suppose, forced to reproduce later in life, they tended to start developing longer lifespans. And this is fantastic and great research, but when the researchers actually found the gene responsible for causing, and what did seem to be a single gene, they found this one gene responsible for causing the extended life expectancy in these fruit flies. They found it was the same homologous gene in the fruit fly as in the humans that gives us Alzheimer's. What the link between these two genes is, we still don't really know, but it's fascinating, it's there. So backtracking a little bit, why aren't the oceans full of our little jellyfish friend from earlier? Well, most of them die, <laughs> or get eaten. They're only immortal up until the point they get killed. Immortality doesn't mean they're immune to diseases or predators, it just means that barring any sort of accident or disease or predator, they will continue to live. Interestingly enough, if humans had the same life expectancy, uh, i.e. we wouldn't be killed by d old age, we would expect to live around 4,000 years apparently. So another idea about why we might die is the idea that death has a strong influence on kin. We live in a world of limited resources and this means at some point there's going to be competition between different organisms to get these resources. Therefore by limiting your competition with your offspring by no longer being there you're promoting their fitness. This all goes back to the idea of kin selection and probably not for the last time I'm going to recommend Sally LePage's video on kin selection and inclusive fitness. You can find it by clicking here. It's very well worth a watch. We could now talk about the physical changes that happen when we die, but I think I'll leave that for another episode. I'd rather now talk about the similarities between death and disease. The principles behind these ideas are underlined by evolutionary pressure that an organism experiences. In much the same way a pathogen and a host have different sets of outcomes, humans, or better yet, human minds, have a different set of wishes from that of the uncaring hand of natural selection. So the process of what makes us alive is very difficult because it's wrapped up in this mystery of this consciousness up inside our skulls. If we look individually at the millions upon millions of cells that make up a body, not one of them could tell you why I love the smell of fresh bread or certain noises made by certain instruments at certain times can move me almost to tears, but together they come together to make a person a thing, a personality. The act of treating cancer might give us another perspective. Cancer treatments are incredibly effective, but it just takes a couple of cells or one cell to survive for it to spread back. These renegade cells that have their own selfish ideologies can overcome this complete collective grouping of cells. Our entire wonderful, marvellous consciousness can't beat its own cells sometimes. Life is remarkable. We are the perfect example of the whole being better or greater than the sum of the parts. But we think of ourselves as too big. We think of ourselves as an I, not a collection of individual cells 
all been tempered and guided by natural selection, which is what we really are. We who have evolved alongside the rest of life now understand what evolution is and how maybe even to manipulate it. But we suffer from the mistake of thinking that that makes us special, as if the rules somehow don't apply to us. A famous creationist once said that humans can't have evolved from apes because if we had, we would have held on to the tails because they're so incredibly useful. This absurd statement highlights the same point. You cannot choose how natural selection affects us. We may wish to live longer or even completely stop death in its tracks, but we will more than likely fail. We're trying to beat evolution at its own game, the game of perfecting life. So that brings us to the end of this history infection. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, next time I'll be talking about ERVs. As you may have noticed, there's quite a, a long time between these episodes. That's because I've moved house, I've entered the final year of my T PhD, and I've been incredibly busy. I am still making these, but they're going to take a short break. Again, probably a couple, maybe three months, but they will be back. And there are new exciting things. I've got a blog about the history of infection when I'll be posting all sorts of written things about this, no visuals. Um, I'm also working on a more academic side of a history of infection as well. Um, so stay tuned, links all below. I'm also doing a weekly podcast with the fantastic Mars Power. We've done several shows now, I think 10 by the time this comes out. And uh, yeah, well worth checking out if you want to keep following me and listen to me ramble without the help of so much editing. Um, I'd like to say that at the end of this first series, as there seems to be, that I have really enjoyed making these. I really enjoyed the discussions that have happened with you people's viewers. Um, I really do appreciate it, and thank you all for subscribing. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff below, but hopefully the most important thing is that we'll be back for the next episode of A History Infection. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.